2006, reservists, including troops drawn from the Royal New South Wales Regiment, made a significant contribution to the operation. Our patron, who, when commander of 5th Brigade, was responsible for the preparation of two contingents for this operation, will this morning review Australia's operations in the Solomons during the period 2003 to 2000. In their historical context, during on contemporaneous records and reflections of some of the commanders. So, can you put your hands together to welcome our patron for <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Rob. Thanks all for coming along. And it's really good to see so many familiar faces in the audience. And Thank you for coming up and saying hello earlier. And great to see some veterans of Operation Anno here. If you were expecting a detailed review, rotation by rotation, of what happened on Operation Anno, or a detailed review of how we went about the course preparation training, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. The Operations of the Australian Defence Force in the Solomon Islands during the period that I'm concerned with, 2003 to 2013, do not have the scale, the heroics, the bloodshed that earlier operations in that theatre had. But what I do seek to do today is to demonstrate that what occurred during the decade of present interest to us fits in a continuum of operations in that area of utmost strategic significance to this country. And if anything else, if nothing else, this is a warning bell, if you like, or a sign of the absolute criticality of our ongoing engagement in that area. And that this is not a job for some junior diplomat, but something that deserves the highest attention at the highest levels of our government on a continuing basis. So what we'll do is a short overview of the geography, demography and political history of the islands, and then a quick review of Australian military operations in the Solomons over the period or effectively of the last century. And then in more detail, the prelude to Ramsey first deployment, a couple of subsequent deployments, then the entry of the reserve, a couple of subsequent developments, and a bit of a review. One other reason why this is important to me, and why for some years I've spoken to some of the commanders about it being important to start to get this on the historical record, is that from the reserve point of view, it was a real development in the use of the reserves and I think the highlight of how reserves should properly be used or reserve capability should properly be used in our defence structure. And of course, closer to home, the battalions of the Royal New South Wales Regiment played a important role during the reserve period. This society has always had a close association with the Royal New South Wales Regiment. Most of my predecessors have been senior officers of that regiment. If you look at um, patrons like 
Brigadier Carey and of course General Maitland. Uh, there's been a long-standing connection between our regiment and this association and of course the regiment and the association combined some years ago to publish a work on the uh, on the Sudan and that was a significant contribution to New South Wales military history. So I make no apologies for focusing when we come to the reserve on rotations 12 and 16 which were two of the New South Wales led rotations. So a bit about the geography and demography. The Solomons are approximately 2,000 kilometres, I think 1,900 is probably more accurate, northeast of Australia. First significance of that, perhaps in modern day terms, is you can fly there and back from Sydney or Brisbane in a fairly clapped out old Boeing 737. What the Boeing 737s do, they fly into twin towers. And that's not, that is a important prelude to Operation Anarchy. It's an archipelagic state with nearly a thousand islands in all, six main islands, nine main island groups, a land mass of just under 29,000 kilometres, uh, square kilometres. Population, and I, I was putting this together in the early hours of the morning and I didn't pick up an extra Oh, in Muha, really murdered population. <laughs> About 725,000, 95% Melanesian, and small Polynesian, Micronesian, Chinese, and European communities. The capital, Honiara, is located on Guadalcanal, and we'll look at that in a moment. There are 63 local languages. English is the official language, but Solomon's Pidgin is ubiquitous in its domain day-to-day language. So to give you an idea of its relationship to Australia, which many of you will be aware of, a couple of things stand out. I've already spoken about its distance from Australia. In that direction, it is Australia's nearest neighbour. It shares borders with Australia. You can see Poniara on Guadalcanal. The other significant thing about that position is if you draw a line from, say, Brisbane, perhaps Sydney, to Los Angeles, the Solomons stand pretty much astride the sea lines of communication between Australia and the United States. And if they're on the sea lines of communication, also the airlines. In 1893, the UK established a protectorate over the eastern half of the Solomons. Germany had a protectorate over the western half. The UK and, the, and Germany established an agreement in 1899, which extended the UK protectorate to substantially the whole archipelago, but transferred Bougainville and Bucca to Germany, German New Guinea, and ultimately Bougainville and Booth became part of Papua New Guinea. In 1976, the Solomons were granted internal self-government, and in 1978, full independence as a member of the Commonwealth, and they have a system of constitutional democracy similar to ours, different internal arrangements, but a member of the Commonwealth under the Crown. From that, the strategic significance of the Solomons to Australia would all ready to be starting to emerge. It was recognised at an early stage, and in the debates that led to federation, and in the debates around the first federal election, the importance of the Solomons, that archipelago of islands to our north east, as it was described, was a factor. It was rightly seen as a potential shield to Australia if in friendly hands, and a potential threat 
you can lay hands of a hostile power, and then the focus with Germany is a potential hostile power. Partly as a result of that, our Commonwealth Constitution makes specific provision, not limited to the general external affairs power, under section 51, paragraph 30, empowering the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws with respect to the relations of the Commonwealth with the islands of the Pacific. Now that significance was recognised by the framers of the Constitution in 1899. Most of you will be aware that Australia's first significant action in the Great War was the deployment of the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force to seize and secure the German possessions in the Bismarck Archipelago, in particular New Guinea and New Britain. That was itself a remarkable effort. A force was assembled from scratch in a very short time and deployed within the first month of the declaration of war to secure the first of all, Reval, and later, mainland New Guinea. If people say or argue what was Australia doing in the Great War, and what did the uh, guns on in Europe have to do with us, as they sometimes do, the answer is twofold. First of all, our trade depended on the sea lines of communication with the UK and the Suez Canal, but that's beside the point for present purposes. But secondly, if the war had ended the other way, it would not have been the German colonies in New Guinea, Rabaul, and thereabouts that were on the table of the Treaty of Versailles. It would have been the UK dependencies in Australia and New Zealand. We had a very real interest in the outcome of that conflict. But by seizing the, the German colonies in Rabaul and in New Guinea, Germany was deprived of a base for its Pacific fleet, an opportunity to seriously interfere with sea trade with Australia, and a base from which operations in the Pacific could be launched. Though, strictly speaking, they're part of the Bismarck Archipelago, not the Solomons, they have the same or similar strategic significance, the same lessons emerge from them. We move forward to the Second World War, <coughs> and you'll know that in 1942, Australia deployed the ill-fated Lark Force, mainly a militia force, to defend the ball where it unsuccessfully defended the Japanese invasion early in 1942. Many went into captivity, and many, as one of you has reminded me this morning, died on board a ship that was torpedoed by an American submarine conveying prisoners from the war. A great book written by a former judge of my courts, or my former court, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, David Selby, who was a, I think, a captain uh, on, on that deployment, called Helen High Fever, tells the story from a relatively junior commander's point of view of the Japanese assault and the withdrawal and the escape of some. Japan <coughs> recognised the significance of the Solomons and proceeded to seize Tulagi, a smaller island between Guadalcanal and Malaita, but which was the headquarters of the, the then capital and the headquarters of the colonial outposts. So Japan seized Tulagi and then Guadalcanal, and recognising the strategic significance of occupying that part of the Pacific, commenced to build an airfield on Guadalcanal. That totally imperiled the sea lines of communication between Australia and the United States, and it was at that <coughs> time, or shortly before that happened, that Curtin had said, we now turn to America, or we now look to America. So here was a 
effectively a direct stab at the lines of communication that our new closest ally was potentially going to support us across. Then United States land forces fought fierce battles to retake Guadalcanal and then the other islands. The United States and Australian naval ships fought great battles with the Imperial Japanese Navy in the slot, the strip of water that runs between the Eastern Islands and the Western Islands. The ship that bore the name of our nation's capital, the heavy cruiser, the 8-inch cruiser, the Mayors of Canberra, was sunk just off Guadalcanal. Meanwhile, up and down the islands, as a number of you have reminded me this morning, were Australians supported by indigenous Solomon Islands, Islanders, who acted as coach watchers, bravely gathered intelligence, and relayed that chiefly to the Americans and back to Australia to forewarn them about what had taken off from the revolvable truck and was heading down the spot to engage them that day or that night. And there's been a recent book released on the coast watchers, some of you will one of you will remind me of the name of the author, but it's a good read as to the heroics of that period. Then having retaken Guadalcanal uh, and the other islands, Australian forces were involved in the recapture of Bougainville and then ultimately of New Britain and Rabat itself. We then roll forward. We've spoken about independence in 1976 and 1978. 20 years later, ethnic tensions on the Guadalcanal escalated. The Guadis, as the people of Guadalcanal are known, resented the influence of settlers from other islands, particularly Malaita, on the other side of the spot. What had happened is that with the American presence on Guadalcanal and the superior economic opportunities on Guadalcanal, many people from other islands had come to Guadalcanal, Malaita effectively the second largest island in terms of population in particular. Because land ownership is passed through the female lines, Malaysian men would marry Guadi women and acquire land in Guadalcanal. The they also occupied undeveloped land around Toniara. Two rival militant groups emerged and violent clashes developed between them. One was the Guadalcanal Liberation Army, the GLA, and the other the Malaysian Eagle Force, the MEF. The Guadalcanal Liberation Army was led by a gentleman is probably a uh, generous word, uh, but an almost mythical figure, Harold Keke. In these tensions, as the period is known, 20,000 Malaitans were driven from Guadalcanal. But over the decade leading up to 2000, Australia was averse to intervening due to the stigma of neo-colonialism. Some formal requests for intervention were declined during that period. In October 2000, the Townsville Peace Accords negotiated or purported to negotiate a truce. An unarmed international peace monitoring team was deployed from November 2000 to June 2002. But it proved futile because it didn't have the ability to compel cooperation and it wasn't able to disarm the militias. As a side note at this stage, the Solomons were already in 2000 an economic battleground between China and Taiwan. Those of you who have been there will recall driving around the place and seeing the various palm plantations, signs denoting the 
support of one or other of those powers. At that stage though, and until relatively recently, Taiwan had the upper hand in, the, in that tussle, that economic tussle. In 2003, the Royal, Sol Royal Solomon's Police, the RSIP, and the Solomons had no military force, proved completely unable to contain rising lawlessness. Institutions of state ceased to function. In February 2003, a former police commissioner was assassinated. In April 2003, the Prime Minister requested assistance from our Prime Minister. Meanwhile, there had been a significant development between the previous refusals of requests for assistance and now. And it was 9-11, which changed the geopolitical landscape. Australia began to recognise that the Solomon Islands was a potential source of, terror, of a terrorist threat to Australia. Criminal elements were well established in the Solomons and the potential use of it as a launching base for a 9-11 type attack on Australian cities was recognised. This had a significant effect on prior Australian reluctance to intervene. Australia could no longer sit passively with transnational criminals and potentially terrorists taking hold in our close neighbour. And so the key point that emerges at this stage is that while Operation Help and Friend as one of the as the operation one of the operation's names described correctly that we were going there to help a friend, our decision to intervene mirrored our historical concern prevent a threat to Australia developing in an area of key strategic importance to us. And so the result was the Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands, or RAMSI. RAMSI was an Australian-led partnership between the Solomon Islands, Australia, New Zealand and 14 Pacific Island nations. It was endorsed by the Solomon Islands Parliament and by the Pacific Islands Forum, the Assembly of Pacific Island States. It was supported by the United Nations and by the Commonwealth. It involved a long-term commitment to create conditions for a return to stability, peace and a growing economy. It, had, it was police-led, and we'll come back to that, with police, military and civilian, including OSAID components. It was led by a special coordinator, both of them senior and experienced professional diplomats, first Nick Warner and secondly James Bentley. Ramsey arrived in country in July 2003. It rapidly restored law and, law and order and brought the nation back from the brink of failure. The military component was withdrawn in 2013 and Ramsey came to an end on the 30th of June, 2017. When Ramsey was launched, the wider strategic context for Australia was our deployments to Afghanistan had commenced. The crisis in Iraq and our deployments there were developing concurrently, and in fact the battalion that provided the component the infantry component of the first deployment of the Solomons was already sending a company to Iraq. We had ongoing border security issues. The first Timor-Leste operation in Tibet was over and General Cosgrove, who had led it, was now Chief of the Defence Force but there were still troubles there and we would go back to Timor-Leste pretty soon. The military component of Ramsey bore various names. The whole operation was known in the Solomons as Operation Help and Friend, as I've said. Uh, the Australian military operation 
was called Operation Anno, but the force in country was called Combined Task Force 635. Some of the other contributing nations favoured a less robust approach, but the Australian government thought that a substantial military component was necessary because there were armed militants who had refused to surrender weapons to the previous unarmed deployment. So it was thought, and it proved a good call, that an initial large-scale show of force was necessary to persuade militia groups to surrender their weapons. Nick Warner would later say, we took a force that was far bigger than was hoped to be ever going to, we were going to need. But sometimes a sledgehammer is a very good way to crack a nut. It tends to avoid damage to the sledgehammer. The mission as a whole was police-led. Now conventionally in peace operations, there's a military effort first to establish peace, followed by a handoff to police and civilian authorities. In this case, there was a concurrent approach from the outset, and the police were always the supporting force, while the military was the supporting force. General Cosgrove gave guidance to the initial contingent commander, the then Lieutenant Colonel John Fruin, now Lieutenant General John Fruin, of COVID fame, but much more importantly, uh, currently commanded Joint Capability. That guidance was to get in and get out because Cosgrove was alert to the concurrent pressures ongoing in Afghanistan, building in Iraq and in people. He didn't want to have an ongoing drain of a substantial part of his force. And this was coming from the most red part of his force, the red Italian group. The second part of his guidance was not to build dependencies. And that was not to create an economic dependency on, or a welfare dependency on our defence force. So generally speaking, the CPF was resourced from Australia. It didn't go shopping in the, in the Solomons, I think much to local disappointment. And while the hospital was on board, HMAS Manura, it wasn't for sure because that would also create a local dependency. The CPF commander was required to consult with the head of the visiting contingent, that's the special coordinator, then Nick Warner, but the special coordinator had no authority over the military forces, though he was required to coordinate the effort with respect to national interests. <coughs> Command arrangements like this work well when there are people of goodwill in all of the positions. And we got away with that. But my take on it is that the command arrangements were a bit too ambiguous for what I would have liked to consider safe. <coughs> the combined task force initially comprised the task force headquarters a light infantry battalion, 2nd Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, minus one company, and a 4th New Zealand Rifle Company was added about a month later, so there was effectively a complete light infantry battalion there. Rotary and fixed wing aircraft, some caribous, and I think New Zealand brought four Iroquois and Australia four Iroquois. A range of naval vessels, most importantly, including HMAS Manura, comprehensive sweep of intelligence assets, and a 30 person strong civil military cooperation element. And that element was there because Cosgrove <coughs> had regretted not having a CIMIC element in Interfet, and he insisted that there would be a CIMIC component of NO.
not unlike the ANMEF many years earlier, the military component of Ramsey was worn out, formed, and deployed in less than three weeks. It peaked at just under 2,000 in the early months, and you can see the various troop contributing nations there. It deployed by air and sea, by C-130 into Henderson, and by HMAS Menorah uh, onto Red Beach, of all places where the Marines had landed in 1942. The posture was alert but friendly. They arrived, rifles slung, smiling. The locals were there to welcome and to cheer them as they arrived. In the first month, they got around the islands, explaining who they were and why they were there, and stating that they would return to collect weapons in, uh, in another month. And so they followed up a month later. And one of the big lessons they learned was that to disarm these militias and to convince everyone that they had been disarmed, <coughs> you can't just take the weapons and spirit them away because no one believes that they've gone. They have to be visibly destroyed. And you would have seen in uh, the fire about this lecture, I think, a photograph of weapons being burnt. That didn't always work because burning the weapons doesn't necessarily destroy the barrels or the working parts. But uh, eventually, when that didn't work, uh, lathes and other appropriate equipment were taken out. And the Solomon Island women, particularly, were delighted to see these weapons not just being taken, but being destroyed. And that was a significant step forward in pacifying the militias. A primary effort was the capture of Harold Kecky. Once he was secured, the whole mood of the country changed. And once he was captured, the Malayan legal force agreed to surrender its weapons. In a little more than 100 days, security was restored, the key warlords were arrested, the two key rival militias had surrendered, over 2,500 weapons were collected and destroyed, along with hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition. After that, the operational role for the military declined. Most of the force was repatriated to Australia after four months. General Fruin, who kindly provided me some reflections, and some of what I've already said is drawn on them, uh, drew heavily on Green's lessons from Bougainville. Green, of course, wrote, some, wrote the uh, War Memorial, the official history on peacekeeping operations. He drew heavily on what Green had written about Bougainville. He incorporated them in his planning, and they included not intervening in the local economy and not creating dependencies <coughs> in the way that Cosgrove directed. For him, force projection proved very important. The manure was not, as you know, a fighting ship, but in the Solomon Islands, the appearance of the manure at sea off a village had an equivalent effect to the appearance that the USS Missouri might have had elsewhere. And with helicopters, there was the ability to project force both from the ship and land. And I think some of the later rotations that didn't have that capacity, sure they didn't need it to the same extent, but the sense were much quieter, but the lack of the ability to project their force probably detracted from the effect that some of the later rotations could otherwise have had. Fruin stresses that the legitimacy of the whole enterprise was important. The endorsement of the government of the Solomon Islands, the endorsement of the Pacific Islands Forum, and the support of the United Nations. And his ultimate observation was that the confidence of the struggling nation was restored. All that was achieved without firing a single shot. And the overwhelming support of the local population was there at the beginning and there at the end.
military personnel were withdrawn from the weather coast. The weather coast is the southern coast of Lauder Canal, uh, remote, inhospitable, but it was the homeland of the Guadal Canal Liberation Army. A continued presence was maintained at the Row Bay Prison, which some of you will remember, and on the lighter for a while, although that too was withdrawn. The then Lieutenant Colonel John Hutchison, who was the commander of the rotation during March, August 2004, some of you may have come across him as uh, I think CFO at Sydney Legacy and on the New South Wales RSL, uh, said of the relationship with the police, and I think this really captures very well uh, how it operated. The aim of Ramsey was to ensure that PPF elements dominated, with the mission's military personnel remaining in the background. At no time did the military forces act independently to arrest suspected criminals or restore law and order. The bulk of the military activities consisted of protection and security duties, provision of logistic support and transport for civilian agencies, and the maintenance of a quick response force of a rifle platoon. Colonel Hutchinson also commented on the force multiplying effect of the Pacific Island nation's component said the skill and ease with which personnel from Pacific Island countries were able to establish a good rapport with the local population was noticeable. The ability to speak and understand Pidgin greatly assisted patrols conducted by PNG troops. In contrast, personnel from the New Zealand and Australian Defence Forces never achieved the same rapport with the local people beyond the level of a smile and a greeting. Now that may have been so at that stage, my impression from what I've read of some of the later rotations is that the reserve components were very good at uh, interacting with the local people and at least participants in those rotations report back establishing a very good report. In the early hours of 22nd of December 2004, an AFP Protective Services officer, Adam Dunning, was shot and killed by a sniper in Boniara while conducting a vehicle patrol. A Company of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment, a ready company group, was alerted on the same day. Within 18 hours, about 100 men, vehicles and equipment arrived by three C-130s at Henderson. This used the inherent utility and flexibility of light infantry to rapidly deploy, deploy forces into an unfamiliar and complex environment, to assume command of the Five Nation Coalition Joint Task Force, to support an 11 nation participating police force, and to demonstrate the government's resolve to support the ongoing success of Ramsey. This reinforcement was in country only for a month. But while it was there, its practical effect was to increase from the three to 12 number of infantry sections conducting patrols, and with it, a patrolling program throughout the islands of Malaysia and Guadalcanal. Both sections performed more than 300 tasks over that month period, including foot and mobile patrols, special response and investigative operations, provincial patrols, and providing a QRF. Armed patrols searched for the perpetrators of the murder of Dunning, and three significant anti-Ramsey personnel were captured, supporting the Solomon Islands police. An additional infantry company was deployed after riots in April 2006, but the CTF had fallen to only around 60 soldiers by the end of 2006. By 2007, the ADF had very significant concurrency pressures. There was Afghanistan, there was Timor-Leste, there was Iraq, and there was border security issues. At this stage, a couple of, I think, courageous generals decided that ammo would be allocated to the second division. The first was Commander 2nd Division, uh, 
Major General Ian Flower, who reached out for the opportunity and said, we can do this. And the second was Major General Mark Kelly, the then Land Commander, who was ultimately the person who made the call that yes, the second division can do this. And so it came that for the first time since the Second World War, a reserve collective capability was deployed on an expeditionary operation. In that, the reserve was used to provide operational capability at the lower end of the spectrum of land operations. By doing that, it relieved pressures at the higher end of that spectrum by freeing the more highly trained, more experienced and higher readiness, higher end forces for those higher intensity operations, particularly in the Middle East. And that, I think, is exactly how our reserve should be used. Although there had been a partial reserve deployment on Rotation 11, it was commanded by a regular CO of a battalion which was part regular, part reserve from Queensland. The first second division rotation was Rotation 12 in 2007. It was commanded by the then Lieutenant Colonel, now Brigadier Peter Connor. Uh, he was then commanding officer of the 2nd 17th Battalion of the Royal New South Wales Regiment and it was mounted by the 8th Brigade and based essentially on 2nd 17th and 41st Royal New South Wales Regiment. Reservists were put on a six month continuous full time service contract. And that comprised two months of force preparation in Australia focused on security operations and four months in country. <coughs> the training over that two month period was intense. Typically it would be conducted partly in home locations, Holdsworthy, partly in Townsville and culminating with a mission rehearsal exercise which at least through until about rotation 18 and again certainly for rotation 21 because I marked Cowley Beach was conducted at Cowley Beach in Queensland just south of Cairns. One of the reasons for that was acclimatisation. Uh, the climate in Cowley Beach is close to that in the Solomons and we all thought it was important that our troops be acclimatised before they land in country. The criticism that could be made of the training, not only on the first rotation, but I think right through, and I'm not totally convinced that it's a criticism, is that it tended to create an excessive picture of the threat. A, the company commander on rotation 12, uh, now Lieutenant Colonel McCrone, uh, reports that the training created the impression that any congregation of three Solomon Islanders was the start of a riot. And of course the picture in country by then was far different. On the other hand, and I certainly adopted this approach uh, through rotations 16, 21 and 25, was that we wanted to have our troops trained for the worst possible day in the Solomon Islands, not the average day in the Solomon Islands. And if the training was at a higher level and involved uh, worse threat scenarios that, than existed, so be it. The other criticism that could be made, in the, particularly in the early periods, is that commanders and soldiers probably received too little exposure to the Ramsey political context and went in country into a context that they had not previously appreciated in terms of working with the police and the civil components. Nonetheless, the ARARSM of Rotation 12, who was a Vietnam veteran, in a later Army news article, reported that Rotation 12 was as tactically well prepared as the contingents that had been sent to Vietnam. 
In country, the force structure was a larger structure than that that preceded the reserve deployment. It comprised the CTF headquarters, which was effectively a battalion level headquarters with a few add ons for the extra functions of a combined task force. An Australian Lieutenant Colonel CO, in this case Connor, a New Zealand Major as the second in command. Five platoons, three drawn from the Australian Defence Force, one from the New Zealand Defence Force, and one from the Pacific Islands. I think it was always either PNG or Tonga by the time we were there. I think the other nations had ceased to contribute to the CTF uh, by that time. Again, I'm very grateful to Brigadier Connor for providing me with some feedback and reflections. He saw his mission as to provide security to the participating police forces by a low key but constant presence. There was during this period some police ambivalence towards the need for a military presence at all, and at least sometimes the police commanders would express the view that they didn't think the military should be there and they didn't want the military visible because they thought it gave the wrong impression. They didn't want soldiers in body armour and with arms roaming up and down the streets of Honiara. Some of those attitudes led the then CO and subsequent COs to recognise that they needed to be able to shape the tasking to suggest what they could do to help. And over the years, I think that progressed pretty well. And indeed, as we'll see in the later rotation, <coughs> the relationship with the PPF improved over time. The outcomes that Colonel Connor saw were working in a multinational regional team to restore security, governance, and economic stability a genuine appreciation from the people of the Solomons, and that reservists with their borderline experience, their flexible and innovative attitude, their civilian skill sets, proved ideal for this mission, most particularly for <coughs> underground integration with other service aid delivery agencies and community engagement. The soldiers proved popular with the Solomon Islanders, particularly when they could put their civilian skills to good use in both urban and regional and rural areas. And they were a symbol of stability, security, and the hope for a better future. Rotation 12 proved the concept. <coughs> Chief of Army visited fairly early on in that rotation, and thereafter, responsibility for Operama, Operation Anno was rotated around the six reserve regional brigades. Later, some of the appointments, some of the senior appointments in the headquarters, in particular the lead commanding officer, were extended to 12 months, and that was because the relationship with the PPF had got to the stage that the PPF had wanted an ongoing uh, link with the one person and not to have to re-establish relations with a new commanding officer every four months. Rotation 16 in 2008 was the first for which I was responsible for the force preparation. It was commanded by then Lieutenant Colonel, now Colonel Glenn Weir. He was commanding officer of the 4th, 3rd Battalion of the regiment. The rotation was mounted by the 5th Brigade and based on the 1st, 9th, 10th and 4th, 3rd Battalion. Its operations involved the CTF headquarters at Global Canal Beach Resort, where the uh, CTF had historically been located. For those who haven't been there, I can tell you that Beach Resort is a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> there was a company minus at a place called Maritime, where the reaction force was based, and if I remember to put in the next map, we'll have a look at the deployment in a moment. A platoon at Road A, which was the prison. It's, and that 
in Platoon would have a section at any one time in an OP overlooking the prison. Although I think theoretically the idea was to prevent escapes, practically it was more about preventing break-ins and preventing uh, missiles, messages and other things being thrown from the overlooking hills into the prisoners communications with the occupants. There was also at that stage a platoon at a place called Balasuna, which is about 30 kilometres southeast of Poniara in a rubble plantation there. One of the important uh, aspects of this was it gave each of the platoon commanders an opportunity to have their own platoon away from the main force uh, with their own responsibility to manage their platoon, to look after its uh, logistics and resupply, and a whole raft of junior officers got on the ground operational experience in that way, which I think will live with them forever. Under Colonel Weir, some patrols to the weather coast were also resumed, and I remember at the time being absolutely delighted that he had had the initiative to get to the opportunity to do that. Another of Glenn's achievements was much improved relations with the PPF, and I certainly got the impression on visiting, as I did a couple of times, that the PPF were now really wanting to engage with the CPF. And while there was an idea that they needed not to be too visible, they nonetheless wanted to make use of them. Glenn's observation is that unrest was brought to an end and collapse in the Solomon Society avoided. Yes, we do have the map, so if I can. Uh, Honiara. Battlesoon was located somewhere down about here from memory. Uh, Maritime is located between, or we'll put GBR out there. Maritime is located on the edge of Honiara, between the beach resort and Honiara. The significance of that was that there was a major river between Guadalcanal Beach Resort and the uh, city of Honiara. That was a vulnerable point if you wanted to deploy a QRF from GBR. So the QRF was located on the other side of that bridge, closer to Honiara, where a blockage on the bridge would not impede its deployment. Rovane Prison was located just to the west of Honiara, and this is the west coast down here. That is Marty that I referred to earlier, and that's the mitre on the other side. In 2010, the CPF was reduced from five to three platoons. Typically that was either one or two Australian platoons or uh, alternating with a New Zealand platoon and always one for St. Gardens platoon. I think there might be someone who was there on the later rotation, so tell me if I've got that wrong, but that's my recollection at the time. Since the 2010 elections, there have only been around about, or there were only about 170 personnel in country. They adopted an increasingly non-aggressive posture. My recollection is that at about this time, they stopped wearing body armor when they went out of the Barracks. But I do have a recollection that I think on rotation 21 there was a call out of the CPF and there may even have been a shot fired near Parliament House when uh, there were certain lots thrown and I think there may have been a shot fired. I remember I was in my chambers uh, overlooking the domain and got a phone call from the uh, CO to update me on that incident then. Military component was completely withdrawn in 2013, and that was the end of Operation Anno. Ramsey remained until 2017. What's happened since? 
Upon the end of Ramsey, on the 1st of July 2017, a bilateral police capacity development program was established. On the 14th of August 2017, a security treaty providing for the rapid deployment of Australian police, defence and civilian personnel in the event of an emergency was signed. It came into effect on the 13th of June 2018. It was activated in November 21, following civil unrest in Honiara, when 300 personnel, military, police and civil were deployed, along with Fijians, Papua New Guineans and New Zealanders, to restore law and order. But then, on the 19th of April 22, China and Honiara executed a security pact, providing for China to cooperate with Honiara on maintaining social order, protecting safety, aid, and so on. Just the sort of thing that we should have been doing. In total, about 7,270 ADF personnel served on Operation Anode over the decade. Just under 30% of them were reservists from December 2006 the CDF was predominantly comprised of reservists. Some have argued that the military presence should have been ended or reduced dramatically much earlier. Ramsey's critics wanted its earlier termination. In 2013, some senior PDF officers have viewed that, except that that could have been done. Again, remember that there was a QRF call out in 2010, there was a request for assistance in, uh, as again after we left in 2021. The CTF was essentially about a deterrent effect. You don't know whether you need that deterrent effect until you need to respond to an incident. I suspect the presence of the CTF throughout that period continued to serve as a deterrent effect and you can see that its absence after 2017 meant, yes, it took some years before troubles re-emerged, but nonetheless, they didn't re-emerge while it was there. In the short term, Ramsey absolutely restored peace and order and set the conditions for state building and built goodwill. It was a paradigm example of the employment of reserve forces at the lower end of the spectrum, freeing other forces for higher end operations. It was also a paradigm example of employment of reserve forces because it played to reservists' characteristics and exploited them. And the time frame of a six month contract, two months force preparation, four months in country was workable for many reservists. We had significant fights and debates at that time about extending those periods to eight months with a six month in country period. I always took the view, it wasn't a universal one, but if we kept it at six months, we were making it available to the maximum number of reservists and ensuring that we would be able to continue to do the job. We didn't do any significant capacity or infrastructure building. I think one of the rotations did do some work with a school up on the Horseshoe Hill, uh, but where one of the Japanese redoubts had been during the Second World War. But humanitarian assistance and aid to the community weren't within our remit. I have always wondered why not, and while I sympathise with the view you don't necessarily want to build dependencies, the goodwill of that nation is so critical to us, I reckon we should be doing just about anything we can to generate goodwill, and if that involves creating a dependency, well, maybe that's a risk that we ought to take with it. Some contribution to infrastructure building and capacity building might have gone a long way to convincing the Solomons that they didn't need China. And so the enduring theme of which Ramsey and Operation Anode is but part is that the 
stability and the goodwill of the Solomons is absolutely critical to our security as a nation. We took our eye off the ball for a while after 2017, and it didn't take long for a threat to exploit that. I do think we've got our eye back on the ball now, but the lesson we've learned is that we should never again allow something like that to happen. Thanks so much for listening. I'm happy to take questions or discussions if there are any. Uh, I don't promise to be able to answer them, but I'll do my best, and there might be someone else here who can answer them if I can't. Where does Australia stand now with regard to the Solomons? And the fact that China's offering the services we're providing earlier. Well, China's offering them, but the Solomons aren't saying that we are still their preferred security partner. Uh, the Solomons are also saying that a Chinese base in the Solomons is not on the cards. I really think that would be something we could not tolerate, and I don't know what would happen if we started seeing walls being built in an island and the like. So, but, but without getting into politics, I do think that uh, since there has been a change of government in this country, the current government has engaged furiously with the region. The foreign minister has been there several times, and a lot of good work has been done to win back our position. Yeah. I have two questions you partly answered, one of them um, about China, but early in your presentation, you mentioned as one of the justifications for Ramsey was after 2001 um, the perceived terrorist threat. What possible evidence was there for Islamic terrorist threat in the Solomons at that time? And the second question was, although as I said you partly answered, in light of the uh, uh, strategic uh, arrangement with China, how successful? then do you deem the whole experience since it resulted in precisely the kind of threat that the whole thing was set up to stop? Well, both of them are very good questions. As I understand the position, no one was saying there is a present terrorist threat. There was concern that there were criminal elements with significant opportunities in the Solomons where fake credit cards could be obtained and other criminal dealings as a uh, precursor to potential terrorist threats could develop. It was, as I understand it, more uh, precautionary than responsive to a particular threat, but the mindset had changed with 9-11. The mindset now was, well, a place like that could be a threat to us, we need to do, or we are justified in doing something to ensure that the place, or to contribute to a place being stable, not a place that could turn into a seedbed of terrorism. So I, I don't think anyone was saying there's an Islamic terrorist threat coming out of the Solomons right now, but it was proportional. The second question is it's something that you can ask yourself about many of our was the blood and treasure invested in Afghanistan worth it? Um, I think if you compare that with the Solomons, we at least got some return from the Solomons. We had stability for 10 years. I think we are still well regarded, even affectionately regarded by most of the people of the Solomons. The problem is that governance in the Solomons does not have the uh, same level of integrity and supervision that ours does. I don't think they have a National Anti-Corruption Commission. <laughs> <laughs> and one hears, I don't know what the evidence is, but one hears that money changes hands to make decisions. And you can't always do that. Uh, absolutely, the Chinese inroads 
are disappointed after all this effort. But unlike what's happened in Kabul, I don't think it's final, and I think we still have enough of a reservoir of goodwill there to recapture what has been lost. Paul, you mentioned the uh, arms that the, both the forces had in ancient forces. Was it established where they had come from, and was that part of the security consideration for the Pacific nation? Don't, great question, it would be fascinating to know the answer. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, you just mentioned the sniper incident. It takes a great deal of skill to take those you know, long range shots and everything else. What came under that investigation? Again, I'm afraid I don't know. And I, look, I don't know what the range was either. Um, but that, yeah. So just on that uh, weapons system, I actually deployed over there 29 and 30 rotations. Remnants of war is still over there. Mm. There's significant um, uh, impact on local communities. A lot of the weapons that were recovered were ex World War II uh, vintage and were looking good but not effective. And in fact, we had a, uh, a detachment over there. Certainly when I last visited, it was still there uh, assisting in demining and, and uh, demolition of remnants of war. Yes, that goes on annually, sir. Mm -hmm. um, opera, um, render assistance. That's, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that's a um, multi-nation um, uh, task force that goes over there and uh, <laughs> demolishes uh, both in water and on land. Thanks so much for interest. The best thing I've been, as I say, I wanted to get the Solomons and in particular the uh, reserve part of that onto the record for a while. This gave me an opportunity to do that for which I'm very grateful. I hope it's been of some interest.